haven't left time. Perfect. Well, welcome everyone. We'll get, we'll get started. Um, welcome to our Ask an Expert. I'm Dr. Deirdre Pickerel. I am the Dean of Student Success for Yorkville University and Toronto Film School. I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's Ask an Expert. Um, as most of you will know, if you've been here before, we do this every Friday. We welcome an expert from our community to come and talk to you about a wide range of topics. Um, they'll speak for 10 or 15 minutes and then we will open the floor for questions. On that note, please make sure you're using the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen to post your questions. Uh, in the meantime, I am pleased to turn it over to Catherine Bonney, our Career Services Advisor. Catherine is our host for today and will introduce our speaker. Catherine, over to you. Hi, everyone. On behalf of Student uh, Services uh, Success Team, I am pleased to welcome you today on Ask an Expert. Today, we are proud to host and uh, have our community expert, Mike Watkinson, uh, who is a director at NextGen Professional. He will be uh, talking to us and he brings over 15 years of experience leading teams and individuals with a focus on relationship building and cultural development. Mike's passion is working on junior and intermediate level employees, providing them with the tools and mindset required to maximize their potential and positively impact their firms and industry. I will now go ahead and hand it over to Mike. Excellent, thank you Deidre, thank you Catherine for the introduction and for setting this up. Certainly happy to be here. And hello everybody, welcome to my home office. I should apologize in advance that you happen to hear a dog bark or some voices or other distractions beyond the walls. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna try and rush through a little bit of content that I've put together. What I'm wanting to discuss is really three things. I want to provide you with an introduction to what emotional intelligence is. I want to explain why it's so important to us, both professionally and personally. And then finally, to give you some resources to utilize for continuing research. So my introduction to emotional intelligence came from the work of this gentleman, Dr. Daniel Goleman. Dr. Goleman is an American psychologist. I think he's authored at least eight books on the topic of emotional intelligence. And although he's not really the creator of the term, I think it's easy to say he's the most well-known, most cited authority, with particular focus being on what he's identified as the four domains of emotional intelligence, which you may see written as EI or even EQ. We'd be hard-pressed to take any sort of leadership program or development program that didn't in some way cover Dr. Goldman's four domains. So what we're looking at is the first one is self-awareness. This is our ability to understand our strengths, our weaknesses, our emotional triggers, both positively and negatively, understanding our ego, our biases, our fears, and even some of the, the physical sensations we experience from time to time. Secondly is self-management. Simply put, this is where we do something about what we learned in step one. So we understand our strengths, how do we maximize them? We understand our weaknesses and are comfortable with our weaknesses. How do we eliminate them or at least mitigate them? We understand our emotional triggers. What mechanisms can we put in place to ensure we are not reacting emotionally, but instead responding logically? And it's really these first two domains self-awareness and self-management that you'll hear people refer to often as self-leadership. I'll come back to that in a moment. The third domain, if you do some research on this, you'll see that it's frequently called social awareness. Dr. Goleman usually calls it empathy. Now, empathy or an empathetic person is not someone who agrees with everybody. That's not what it's about. It's simply a deliberate willingness to see a topic from someone else's point of view even if you don't agree with them. It's the concept of other people being different, not difficult, or the ability to say, I don't agree with you, but I'm listening to you and doing my best to understand. And the reason empathy is so important is because it directly contributes to the fourth domain, which is relationship management. I'm gonna run out of room here. There we go. 
Relationship management, essentially, are all those things we do on a daily basis that involve interacting or collaborating with other people. If it's your teacher or students, employer, coworkers, friends, family, or the waiter at a local restaurant, it's our ability to interact with them and have the best outcome from that situation. So those are the four domains, but back up here to this, these two, first two domains that constitute self-leadership. It's within here that we find things like self-motivation, self-confidence, the ability to overcome challenges, to deal with stress, to fail, fall flat on our face, but get back up, learn from the experience and move on. And those skills, and I call them skills for a reason, those skills are kind of a nice segue into the second thing I wanted to talk about, which is really how this benefits our life. Why is emotional intelligence so important? Now, the easy way for me to answer that question would be just to rattle off some statistics for you. But instead, you can do some research on your own. Google search benefits of emotional intelligence. You'll see plenty of reports from groups like Talent Smart or Innovative One, Harvard Business Review, and you'll see all kinds of statistics and percentages that explain why it's so important. But I want to go a little different route. And let's consider how anybody is successful, regardless of what sector they're in, what rung in an organizational ladder they may stand on. There's a couple of common aspects. Uh, the first one, perhaps unfortunately, is luck. We need to consider that a little bit. And when I mean luck, I'm talking about things we can't control. When we were born, where we were born, who our family is, etc. But as far as the things that we actually can control, I think they fall into one of two categories. Our technical ability, hope we can read that, yeah, our technical ability and our emotional intelligence. So when I say technical, I'm referring to your formal education, your on-the-job training, continuing education when you're in your career, your previous life experiences, and this is where our genetics would fall. So our IQ, our natural talent. Emotional intelligence are these four domains. Instead of going the route what some people do, which is to try and establish a percentage of importance, like this is 40, 60, or 30, 70, I would encourage you to look at it this way. Owing to the belief that all of us want to maximize our potential, you're all in school, it's difficult, it's a lot of resources and time, your teachers are stressing you out, sorry, Catherine, to maximize all that technical ability, we need to also focus on, deliberately focus on our emotional intelligence. And just think about it back to what we discussed a few minutes ago about these skills. We're all going to run into challenges. We're all going to fail. We're all going to have weaknesses we need to overcome. The ability to do that is found right in here. And then furthermore, we're all going to have to establish relationships throughout our life and be able to make those relationships positively impactful. So when given consideration to why anybody would actually have a purposeful attempt at increasing their level of emotional awareness, it's really so we can capitalize on our technical intelligence. Um, I think in order to, I'm kind of cognizant of time here, so I may jump forward a little bit. What I want to do is, and one other thing that's important that I, I should actually identify is that the reason I've been calling these things skills, such as motivation and self-confidence skills, is because emotional intelligence is absolutely a learnable process. You can research it, practice it, and over enough time, enough focus, enough effort, you can get better at every one of those four domains. So as far as researching, if you want to look into this after this webinar. The way that I do it is I kind of have two different baskets I utilize. One is sort of, I'll call it a science basket. So neuroscience, biology, psychology, very high level stuff. And then the other basket would be more leadership, team development, organizational development. So to give you a couple of names to research, I've already introduced Daniel Goleman. Mr. Goleman is an author, a public speaker, plenty of information on him on YouTube. I enjoy his books, but to be honest, they're, they're pretty challenging reads, so I watch a lot of his videos. Another great source is Dr. Andrew Huberman. Dr. Huberman is an American neuroscientist. Recently did a podcast with Joe Rogan. And again, there's hours of information from Dr. Huberman. 
As for the leadership team development resources, I'm a big fan of a guy named Simon Sinek. Simon is kind of the it boy in the world of leadership at the moment. He's a good author, but he is a remarkable public speaker. I think he has, if you go on YouTube and search Simon Sinek, start with why, I think that's the second most watched TED Talk ever. He's, he's a remarkable speaker. And the last person would be a guy named Patrick Lencioni. Patrick is a consultant and author, and in my opinion, I think he has some of the best work, best books on the topic of leadership. He writes most of his books as fiction. So it's actually really enjoyable to read as well. So quickly, why I say these two different baskets, the high level understanding of the science behind things, I think is hugely contributes to our self-awareness and self-management. I'll give you an example. I started recently researching stress. What is it? Why do animals feel stress? How, what systems in our body overcome stress? Why are some people so good at it and other people so terrible at it? When you get that kind of high level understanding, it essentially allows you to focus your efforts in the right direction, opposed to trying to stop things that we simply can't prevent. And then the encouragement to get into the leadership aspect, team development aspect. If you research these two guys, they identify why teams are successful. And it may be a little different than what you would actually think. There's things in there like trust and cooperation and cohesion and the ability to sacrifice and openly, honestly debate that really allow teams to maximize their results. And these two guys identify that very well. Now, I know when you all get out in your careers, you are undoubtedly going to be a part of teams. So I would love for you to get a nice base understanding so that not only can you maximize the input or maximize the efficiency of the teams you're on, but when you get the privilege to one day lead a team or to have people reporting into you, and it is a privilege, when you get that privilege, you'll be able to ensure that that team reaches its goals to the best of your ability and also positively impact the other people around you. I can stop there, Catherine, if you want. I, did, I didn't give you a warning as to when I was going to stop, but I, I know we want to get into the Q&A session, so perhaps I can kind of cut it there and then maybe expand on some of what I said. Wonderful. These are um, great book reads for the summer. And I think it relates to all of our programs. I know it relates to all of our programs. So thank you for sharing some great books to, to pick up and, and uh, read, especially over the summer. So we are going to open it up to a few questions. OK, we have. Um, one individual who uh, basically wants to become an actress and uh, they want to be able to uh, discuss with them um, to keep and have emotional conflicts with themselves and what would you advise? So obviously sometimes there might be a conflict where someone wants you to do and follow one path and another person wants you to follow something else. So what advice would you give this individual? If I'm understanding correctly, is it an app, a conflict between someone else's advice and, and this other person's desire? Yes. Or is it, more inter is it more internal conflict with themselves? It's kind of two different. It's their passion and someone yeah. else's advice is what they should follow in, in okay. their career. What advice would I give on that? Uh, easy answer, follow your passion. That's so, uh, you could find a meme on that one. Um, There and just is. to add to that, I found that if you wait, like some of us have waited, then you will follow it eventually later on in life. So I agree yeah, I with you to pursue. One, uh, if you watch Simon Sinek start with why, he describes this concept of your why being your reason for existing. He takes it as far as how a company should operate, but I've taken it as far as looking at it from individuals and having your purpose in life. And that can vary from person to person. But at the end of the day, if you care at all about having your own level of success and being able to positively impact other people, really the only way of achieving that is following your values, following your goals. Like I, I can sort of bringing it back to my own life. I'm actively 
changing the direction of my career that I've had for nearly a decade in order to follow a passion. I don't know who's asking the question. I assume you're not as old as I am. I'm 42, and yet here I go down to finally follow my own passion against the advice of some other people because I have a good career. But I'm willing to over try and overcome the stress and anxiety that I'm feeling in order to chase that. And I think at the end of the day, Catherine, to your point, you're probably going to get there anyway. So put your head down and chase what you want to chase. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we also have um, one question. Uh, what primary... Oh, okay. Let me just go back. What primary tips would you give to reduce stress in others? Oh, great question. Essentially, um, what is the best way to help others you care about in your team and family? Sure. So that's a good Absolutely. question. Absolutely. So it probably that limits it a little bit. I'll explain to how I do it, and, and you, can, uh, you can take it from there. So it's, if you want to say education, um, I just mentioned, I think, I've been researching stress. It probably coincided with the fact that I've been feeling a fair bit. Um, one thing that I realized is, and this is kind of how the science ties into this a tiny bit. One thing to identify is what we often will do is say that stress and anxiety and worry all tie together. They're interchangeable words, and they're really not. What we're looking at, if you actually identify the word stress, stress is simply the physical feeling, okay, the butterflies in your stomach. Kind of feeling that agitation doesn't really feel good. On the other side is worry. This is thinking. It's the cognition part to it. And in the middle is the thing we all want to avoid, which is anxiety. We've all been stressed and not been felt anxiety. We've all worried and not felt anxiety. So how I look at it is I understand from research that actually feeling stress, this physical discomfort, like what I get when I have to do public speaking, is our brain's way of telling our body to do something. To, it's a way of motivating to take action. So it releases this chemical, a series of chemicals from our nervous system that agitate us into taking action. On the other side is worry. We are bombarded all day long with thoughts that we can't control. I think the National Science Foundation estimates we have like 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day, of which 80% are negative. So what that means to me is I can't control certain thoughts coming into my head and I certainly can't control the negative thoughts and I can't control that I feel nervous. So I'm not going to sit there and waste time and energy trying to say, oh, don't be nervous. It'll be fine. Or stop thinking about that because I can't do that. So I'm not going to spend my energy there. Instead, I'm going to realize, yeah, I'm nervous. I get nervous before I public speak, but I also know that I'm going to get over it. Just take action. And as you progress, you get little hits of dopamine, and that actually suppresses the anxiety, suppresses that, those nerves. So don't try and stop. Don't waste your time trying to stop the stress aspect. And the same with thinking. We can't prevent a lot of thoughts from coming in our head, but we can certainly try and put some positive ones in there. So again, back to my example, I can remind myself, even though I'm stressed out and I'm worrying about not this webinar not going well, I can't control any of that, but I can tell myself that I've given dozens of presentations, they've all gone relatively successfully. And, you know, most of the information I'm sharing is personal. So I know it better than anybody. I can purposely put those thoughts in my head. So my advice for if it's yourself that's in this stress, worry, anxiety state is focus on the things you can control. You can't control the butterflies in your stomach. You can't control some of these negative thoughts, but you can certainly be okay with this knowing it's going to go away. And you can put some positive thoughts and positive memories in there. So that bringing this full circle back to emotional intelligence, this is really self-awareness, self-management. I understand what I physically feel when I have to give a presentation. And I have some control mechanisms in there that actually allow me to do it. Does that help? Does that answer the question at all? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you once we get off this call for sure. No, that was very helpful. I love it. Um, okay, so wow, we're um, running out of time. So, any tips uh, to improve EI that you might have? 
Emotional intelligence? Yeah, um, absolutely. I'll go back to my very high level understanding of some science. Um, so I'm not, this is going to be very rudimentary. I'm not a neuroscientist or a psychologist. I'm also not a very good artist. So you can have to pretend that's a picture of the human brain for a moment. On a very high level, our brain has two different sections to it. One of them is the logical part of our brain. This is called our neocortex. It's our prefrontal lobe, sits behind our forehead. That does a lot of our critical thinking for us. The other part of our brain is called the limbic system. And it deals with, amongst other things, our emotions. Happiness, sadness, standard emotions. There's also something down in the emotional part of our brain, a couple of aspects that I believe are chiefly responsible for the quality of our relationships, decision-making ability, communication ability, our ability to overcome challenges and failures. And those three things are our ego, our biases, and our fears. We all have them. We cannot stop them. The goal of emotional intelligence is not to prevent this from happening. It is simply to be diligent in our understanding of what's going on down in the emotional part of our brain so that we can then put some control mechanisms and get it into the logical part. Dr. Goldman uh, very well said in an interview I heard him once said, emotional intelligence lies in the gap between our knee jerk emotional reaction and our desired logical response. So what you want to do practically is a lot of self-reflection. You can do it daily, or I would encourage you to do it uh, situationally. So you go into a meeting at work or in school, ask yourself how you did when you came out. Did you control your emotions? Did they say something that uh, offended you? And then perhaps you reacted negatively with your ego. Did you use your biases to make description or to make uh, suggestions? Were you fearful in any way? Start reflecting on how you actually felt and how you behaved. And if you continue to do this, you're going to notice some trends exist. And you can start to piece together what it is about you that makes you unique. And once you have this level of understanding down here, and really only until you have that level of understanding, can you then start to put some control mechanisms in place. So let me give you an example. I've already loosely touched on this. I have a very real fear of public speaking. The problem is I have an immense passion for sharing this type of information with people. As Catherine said in my intro, particularly young people um, in, in school or in the early stages of their career. So in order for me to live my passion, I can't let this fear control me. So what I've done is I've paid attention to how I actually feel when I give a presentation beforehand when my Heart's pounding through my chest. When does that feeling stop? So when does the stress go away? What other sensations am I feeling when I'm speaking to people? Once I've gained that understanding, there's three particular things every time I speak that I have to deal with. I can then put some mechanisms in place logically. And that and only that is what allows me to chase this passion. I also have a fear of jumping out of airplanes and I'm not doing that ever. At least not one that's functioning properly. I can, I can die never jumping out of an airplane and not feel any, and not feel bad. But if I wasn't able to share this message with people because I couldn't control this fear that I have in me, I wouldn't have lived the life that I want to live. And that kind of speaks to the, the initial question we were asked with respect to somebody chasing their passion. So long answer, short answer would be self-reflect daily, situationally, Try and figure yourself out to the best of your ability. If you say something silly and then think about it two days later, why did I say that? That was unnecessary. Ask yourself, why did you say it? Did the person say something to you that offended you? Did they trigger your ego in some way so you reacted instead of responding? Spend time figuring yourself out because only at that point can you then put mechanisms in place to not react but instead respond. Very great points, especially the fear. I always say to students, when you go for that interview, don't let the hear, fear hold you back because a lot of the times we say to ourselves, no, I'm not gonna pursue that career. 
no, I'm not going to pursue that job because it's that fear that's holding us back. So very valuable point. There's, if I can just follow up with that, Catherine, real, real quick, there's really two things that helped me um, in my own journey on emotional intelligence. And I know this segment is called Ask an Expert. It really should be called Ask a Student because that's all anybody is that's studying and pursuing uh, emotional intelligence or self-awareness. There was two things. This was one, was this general high-level understanding of how the brain works. The other one is something that is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, simply put, explains how any of us learn or how any of us excel at something. So there's a series of neurons that are required to do any task, and the more we do it, the more they start to wire together, thereby making that task easier. And why this was so important to me is because it made me realize that if I work hard enough at this, if I put enough downward pressure on myself to learn what my ego is and my biases are, and then I struggle, and it is a struggle, to control my responses, I will get better at it over time. So to follow on Catherine's point, if you're feeling fear, like I'm more comfortable now public speaking than I was previously, but I'm not completely comfortable. I know I never will be, but I understand how to control it. And the more I do it, the easier it's becoming. So what this allowed me to do is to take, and you've probably all heard this sentence, that's the way I've always been, therefore that's the way I'm always going to be. This proves that's only half true. Yes, it's the way you've always been. But the way you always will be is a cop-out because of this thing, neuroplasticity, our ability to learn. It's an ability to actually rewire our brain. Now, you're younger than me, most of you, so it's easier for you. But we actually physically can introduce neuroplasticity until the day we die. So these efforts will actually have a lasting effect on you. Thanks, Catherine. I just I wanted to get that in there. Yeah, no, very, very valuable information. This is great. Um, we've uh, come to a few questions, but I'm going to ask just the one more question. We'll have to close it up. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our webinar. Um, I could never tell, by the way, that you're fearful of presentations because you seem like a pro, so I have to add that in. Um, can you tell me, uh, would you be able to offer... Um, how does emotional intelligence impact groups and teams? Sure, absolutely. I, I can do that quickly, I promise. Uh, I'll draw a picture with you. And I ask this because we're all in a class environment through Zoom. Yeah. We're all going to be approaching our careers. So this will be helpful for, for most of our students as well. Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree. So what we're going to do is we're going to build something together. And that something we're going to build is a pyramid. A poorly drawn pyramid, but a pyramid nonetheless. And we're going to draw it, or probably build it, in five distinct sections. So the ground, the part that we need to pay attention to, we need to make sure it's strong. If it fails in any way, causes the whole structure to go down. That is made up of our self-management and self-awareness. The bottom part of the pyramid, the strongest part of the pyramid, is empathy. Now, how does empathy just magically appear? So, if you decide to go down a path of trying to do these self-leadership domains, and it is challenging, like learning anything, like learning an instrument or a language or what you're studying in school, it takes effort, it takes focus. And it also takes you asking some challenging questions of yourself and realizing there's some things about you you probably don't like and you are going to work to get better at. Just that effort will automatically make us more empathetic than we would have been initially. And the reason empathy is so important is because it contributes directly to the ability for a team to debate. Debate is so important with a team. It's critical to have open and honest uh, debate to bring people to the table to take away the fear of what they're going to say is be going to be ridiculed and the reason empathetic debate is so important is because it's the only way to actually arrive at alignment if you don't allow someone to voice their opinion or voice their grievances how can they ever actually align with you? and conversely some studies have shown that if you allow someone to just simply have their say to have some sort of control over where their life is going to go 
they will naturally align with you. We all want some form of control. This is why the first two words we learn as kids when we're asked to do something are no and why. We just want some sort of control. We want to have our say. Once you have actual empathetic debate leading to alignment, now you can hold people accountable. And it's really the only time you can hold people accountable. And accountability comes in two forms. There's self-accountability and group accountability. And both of them exist right here. Self-accountability is part of the self-awareness, self-management aspect. But beyond that, let's say we're part of a team. And I said by Thursday night, I was going to get my section done. And it's Friday morning and I haven't. And you come to me and say, you're disappointed. We're going to have to work all weekend, et cetera, et cetera. My level of self-control is either going to make me say, I'm sorry, you're right. Or it's going to make me react because you've now criticized me. So the self-awareness thing, this, like I said earlier, this base is so important. Once you have that level of accountability, self-accountability, group accountability, there's nowhere left to go but to maximize your team's results. And if we dissect this a little bit, what you're going to look at here, there's kind of two things. We have this, this pyramid. And then we have emotional intelligence domain one, domain two, domain three, and domain four. Before anybody accuses me of being smarter than I am, this pyramid up top here is the work of Patrick Lencioni. All the green circles are the work of Daniel Goleman. All that kind of figure out is how the two mesh together. And the concept to keep in mind here is it starts with each of us. If we simply focus on our own self-leadership, this kind of happens naturally. And I would much rather be part of a team that was healthy than one that was, let's say, smart, which is all your technical abilities. This is how a team ensures they're maximizing their results. Fair enough. That's a, that's a great way to segue into the emotional intelligence. That's for sure. Because like you said, that one you can, that emotional intelligence can be taught. So. Yeah. Yes, that's right. It's a learnable skill. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. And it will apply for any industry and for most of our students. So I thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, for sharing this valuable information today. And um, I hope that hopefully you'll come back. There's a lot to be covered still here. I have a lot of questions that I cannot ask. So uh, hopefully we can get back to them and we'll collaborate uh, getting some answers for the the individuals that have logged in today. So Absolutely. thank you everyone for joining us and uh, have a wonderful weekend. We hope that you'll join us at the next Ask an Expert series. So uh, goodbye everyone.